Hello and welcome to Health Professional Radio. I'm your host, Neil Howard. Thank you so much for joining us for another segment. We're going to be joined this evening by Dr. Dan Paulier, joining us here as Clinical Director of Leukemia Services at the University of Colorado School of Medicine to talk about navigating patient care from the initial diagnosis through treatment, as well as a bit of new research into novel treatments that could benefit those in need. And we're also joined by one of his patients, Dave Cade. He was diagnosed with a type of blood cancer called acute myeloid leukemia, or AML. Uh, He's going to tell us a little bit about his journey, uh, his diagnosis, and how some very innovative new research impacted his particular treatment plan. Welcome to Health Professional Radio, both Dr. Daniel Paulier and Dave Cade. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for having us. So now, of course, you are uh, Dave. You're you're his uh, his patient. Were you familiar with the, with each other prior to this medical relationship? How did you meet? Uh, I didn't even know about his okay. program, but oh. uh, we met about three years ago. I was diagnosed with AML and actually given a death sentence. I they said I had two weeks to two months to get my affairs in order. Two weeks to two months, doctor. Acute myeloid leukemia. We're familiar with the word leukemia. What is acute myeloid leukemia? Is it any different from what we're normally uh, used to hearing about when it comes to leukemia? Yeah, I mean, leukemias are pretty uh, diverse in terms of the uh, diseases that sort of fall under that general umbrella. I mean, in general, leukemia is a, a blood cancer. And so the acute just refers to how active or proliferative or aggressive it is. Myeloid is the, is the specific subtype of leukemia. Uh, so this is, uh, this is one of the more aggressive cancers known to man. Um, and, uh, and, and it, uh, the, the, prog- the, the prognosis that, that Dave was given, um, you know, is, is historically correct in terms of expectations for how people do with this disease. We're just coming out of September's Blood Cancer Awareness Month. Dave, what symptoms initially brought you to the doctor to seek uh, treatment of any kind at all? You know, I, before uh, we went to our personal doctor, and for a month I had just, it was like I was running out of gas. I've always been a, a super go-getter, and it just, day by day, it just seemed like I was running out of gas. And my wife took me to... A hospital uh, north of us, they did probably six hours worth of tests. That's when they gave me the bad news about dying. Doctor, are Dave's symptoms par for the course when someone comes in saying that they just feel tired, fatigued, and don't know why? Is that something that is common, or do these symptoms manifest differently for each patient? Uh, Absolutely. Very common presentation. Um, Fatigue is... uh, a near universal sign uh, for someone newly diagnosed with this disease. You know, the trouble with having much else that's expected or typical is that being a blood cancer, it circulates in the blood and it can really manifest in any organ or tissue in the body. And so there is a very broad range of presenting symptoms that can be consistent with this disease. So um, beyond fatigue, which like I said, is typically pretty universal uh they're they're you know it, it's it's a challenge because you know essentially almost anything else out of the ordinary could be this disease fortunately this disease is extremely rare only 30,000 cases each year in the United States are 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 diagnosed so almost always when a person has some type of symptom it's not AML um but uh, but 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 uh, it you know it, it, we and on the you know the clinical side of this are always on alert for the potential for this disease. What is the the go to standard of care, especially with someone with two weeks to two months to get their affairs in order? And did Dave receive that uh, historical go to care? He he did not, and so this is where I think Dave's story really diverges from the typical expected course. The sort of standard care for this disease at that time was to give intensive chemotherapy, which uh, is extremely difficult for folks, uh, oh, anyone over 60 to really withstand. It's, it's an extremely uh, toxic, high intensity chemotherapy regimen. 
And so when older people, you know, have this disease, it's really difficult to have effective treatment options for them. Dave took a real leap of faith and said he wanted to participate in a clinical trial of a therapy that was under investigation at the time um, and access could be, uh, you know, uh, possible through the participation in, in this clinical trial. And uh, he has had uh, a, a dramatic and, and positive outcome. And this is exactly what we hope for when we have a disease that has so few conventional treatment options. And so, you know, participation in a clinical trial is really what we recommend because we are historically so bad at treating this disease. Uh, but like I said, it's a real leap of faith. Um, and, uh, and, and David, uh, Dave, you know, really went there. And so, uh, 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 it's, it's a challenging situation. Dave, I understand you're, you're in remission now. Tell us about this, this treatment experience, if you would. Um, Dr. Paulier says that it's very, uh, toxic alternatives, very, uh, challenging alternatives, but you received treatment in this trial. How did that experience go for you as far as treatment? And another thing that kept me from the alternative is I'd had open heart surgery, triple ah, bypass. Okay. They didn't think I would even survive the alternative. But the of a, a test study, uh, Dr. Polly put me in the hospital immediately. And I was in seven days. And they gave me a medication and very low dose of chemo. And on the eighth day, they took another, oh, and yeah, I was taking four pills a day. And on the eighth day, they gave me another uh, bone marrow test, and they couldn't find the disease. So no disease was present after eight days after being diagnosed with two weeks to two months to survive. That's incredible. That's correct. I go in every 28 days now, uh, uh, and they uh, in, or they test my blood to kind of stay on top of everything. And so far, it's still not showing up in my body. Dr. Polier, is this treatment exclusively for people of a certain age or who have had, like Dave, certain uh, surgeries or conditions that make them not a good candidate for this treatment? Or can it be used say, in um, childhood leukemia? Yeah, I mean, I think that's a really great question. At the moment, because of Dave and people like Dave who participated in clinical trials, this therapy is now FDA approved for the general population. Okay, and it is, as you suggested, it is approved in the context of an older uh, patient who is too, um, you know, felt to not have a, a good outcome with the standard intensive chemotherapy. We believe that there are um, opportunities to bring this therapy into younger patients, as you suggested, and we are doing those clinical trials, in fact, right now. So we are hopeful that, you know, the future for this disease will have fewer people, even those young and, and healthier people, uh, getting exposed to in intensive toxic chemotherapy regimen. Doctor, give us a website where we can learn more. The the, uh, the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society's website is a great resource for all kind of uh, options for uh, for uh, this type of leukemia and others. And if you go through, uh, uh, look up AML on the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society's website, it will take you to information on this regimen. Dr. Pallier, Dave, I appreciate both of you joining us here on Health Professional Radio this evening. And Dave, I'm so glad that you're doing well. Thank you, Neil. Thank you, Dr. Polly. Yes, sir. Thank you. You've been listening to Health Professional Radio. I'm your host, Neil Howard, in conversation with Dr. Daniel Pollier and Dave Cade. Audio copies of this program are available at hpr.fm and healthprofessionalradio.com.au. You can also subscribe to the podcast on iTunes, listen in, download at SoundCloud, and be sure and subscribe to our YouTube channel at youtube.com, Health Professional Radio.